trying our best to make it available to all parties and all sides of the debates. Um, but then really being engaged on, on the policy aspects of those equations. And that's actually what Secretary Clinton asked us to, uh, to do in this ECPA role, this, Ener this Energy and Climate Pel uh, Partnership with the Americas, where I'm the Energy Fellow, which means I get sent on week-long junkets to uh, try to engage in collaboration with local universities, with industry, um, and to try to work with members of the government, from the ministers of energy on down, in terms of what are the opportunities to envision and plan out different energy futures. And the Cliff Notes version of the talk, for those of you who want to sleep, I think this is my daughter included, um, you only need to, have to go through slide number one and you're really all done. And that is that over and over again, from village communities to discussions in my own home about should we buy a, uh, a more efficient or an electric or the vehicle, up to uh, national and international plans, it's really a discussion that says, be as honest as one can as a broker in analyzing options and thinking through what you'd like to see. It sounds fairly straightforward. And then find ways to analytically but transparently analyze those options. And one of my real worries is that the energy community, as hard as it feels like it works and as hard as I feel like I work on occasion, have done an incredibly poor job in making the pros and cons of all of these choices available. And so I will do my best today to illustrate how that process has worked for us, the places where I feel like we've done a good job in communicating options, the places where I feel like we've done a really poor job in getting those options available to, uh, to politicians, non-governmental groups, industry, etc. And then the piece that I'm probably most proud of isn't the analysis, it's that time after time, we have promised or threatened that we will be an ongoing pain in the ass. And that means that we will find as many opportunities to assist in the doing part of the process. And I say that because in one case I'll, I'll show you in a little bit, our threat to the Prime Minister, in this case in Malaysia, was that you can either have us work with you on solutions or we will do everything we can to be an ongoing annoyance. Um, and that actually was one of the factors that convinced him to, to take up a different perspective. But I got the other call. Um, uh, I've had the fortune of working with a number of the last governors in California, and uh, one of them famously, Governor Schwarzenegger, had the so-called smoking tent. Not a California concept, but the place where he thought that a lot of stuff got done. And what that meant was that once every five weeks I had to make this early morning drive up so that I could be present in the smoking tent to really hash things out. And I discovered that in many ways he was right. Um, that that was the place where a lot of the decisions and the agreements across the aisle got hammered out. Uh, he famously was uh, smoking cigars at the beginning of his term, but at the end he was wolfing down walnuts. Um, but a very diminutive little um, energy uh, chief advisor to him, uh, a very, very short, uh, very energetic woman. She was the one, by the end of the four years, who was smoking these massive stoves. Um, <laughs> they kind of switched roles, but it was an interesting part. He only found out at the very end of his term that she was actually a lesbian. It was complicated dynamics, but the, the smoking tent really got them all on the same page. So I'll start off with just a few comments about how central energy is, and it's not going to be surprising to anyone, but I just want to highlight a number of the features. When I give talks to high school students to school teachers. It's amazing how critical energy is to the economy, but how few of the metrics that really put in perspective are really clear. So uh, a friend of mine, a professor of economics at Berkeley, always highlights that his starting point in discussions of energy, because we are still a fossil fuel uh, addicted and driven society, is that well, what is our oil doing under their country? Is frequently the starting point of many of the conversations. And it's not just, you know, one should know where the oil came from, um, because this is a more seasoned crowd than my undergraduate community. Many of you remember well the oil crisis of the 70s, and that happened at a time when 6% of U.S. imports came from the Middle East. Now, how can a 6%, a drop in 6% of supply, have such wide and long-lasting uh, impacts on the economy, and it's because our refinery capacities and our domestic production was largely maxed out, and so that marginal 6% was critical. And so when we talk about energy security today, and when we talk about opportunities for change, 
it's really critical to keep in mind, not just for our economy, but for example, the economy of China and elsewhere, how significant those small marginal amounts can be in the mix. Many of us now know, and people who live so close to the Canadian border know that um, Canada is in fact our largest supply, followed by Mexico, not the Middle East as we often think about. And changes in Canada that I'll get back to uh, are really critical to thinking about the, the story. Venezuela is having its elections today, and so what happens with both the current politics in Venezuela, but its supply of unconventional fuels are going to affect us in many ways. And so while well, I have to admit, I didn't see this bumper sticker, but my colleague Severin Bornstein, who runs our energy markets lab at Berkeley, reminds me of it. But a bumper sticker I did see is this one. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, everyone here will know right off it's on the side of a Prius, which I found even better. Um, and this really brings up the, the issues and the thoughts about what is a resource curse and how can not only we avoid that curse, but how can countries thinking about their energy futures really plan differently? And so one of the things that really gives me a very warm feeling, um, not a global warming, but a warm feeling about what our, what our energy options are is that whatever you think about the fact that uh, Norway, a huge investor in social causes around the world, and a country I'll come back to, actually is using its oil and gas resources to fund not only its own economy, but to put huge amounts of money into aid and investment products overseas. Um, Norway is, has an ongoing dialogue with Ghana right now, and Ghana is poised to be the next Norway in terms of the massive amount of offshore gas. But I don't know what will come out of that dialogue, but Ghana is looking in incredible detail sending delegations on a weekly basis to Norway to look at how they put money into schools and transparent government and a whole range of features, specifically so that they can do their best to follow a more Norwegian model than, shall we say, the Saudi model. Now, there are benefits and disadvantages of many perspectives, but one of them that has really caught the Ghanaian eye is that Saudi Arabia, unlike like many oil producing countries, subsidizes fossil fuel use dramatically at home. And that has led to a number of features in their economy. Norway taxes fossil fuel use dramatically at home. And they put even more of that money into economic transitions and shifts. And there is a tricky story here. Norway is, uh, is a significant oil and gas exporter, very significant. Um, but they're using it to finance a transition. So that's really part of the process. And when I look back at times when the same kind of approach to using energy wisely has really galvanized actions in the U.S., I go back frequently to a 1942 uh, billboard, um, when you ride alone, you ride with Hitler. So this is a, uh, an early, very strong version of a statement around energy efficiency and wise use of resources. Um, and, and Bill Maher, I had the, the, the pleasure to talk with many times about this. When I showed him this bumper sticker, I guess it shows you uh, what first movers do. I was thinking, how might I use this on a book title or something else? Well, two weeks later, Bill had already used it um, in a book he was doing. And so it does highlight these kinds of stories. It's a wonderful use of this picture, um, and it really it illustrates many of the features. Another version of really how central energy is and I'll paint this in terms of greenhouse gas emissions terms. And that is that energy is actually the largest legal industry on the planet. Um, food is the second largest legal industry on the planet. And it's hard to rank, there's a couple others that may or that may be higher or lower than some But in terms of the flows, the financial flows, and the, fi and the flows of goods, um, the world really, um, energy one and, um, and food number two, with a couple others that we might look at, so what I'm going to look at is just, uh, just very briefly uh, a graph showing a number of our economic downturns and problems in the past and highlighting them in terms of what they did in terms of emissions, pollution, greenhouse gases. And so here's a graph going back to the 60s. You see the oil prices in the 60s and you can see a real blip that's very visible in terms of, of greenhouse gas emissions. The U.S. savings and loan scandal, again an economic downturn and a real significant change in emissions. Um, the collapse of the former Soviet Union that changed the availability of resources, the Asian financial crisis, and all of these we saw a downturn uh, in the economy. And they fit into a pattern, there's economic cycles and theory about these stages. 
The one that we're in now is either the exception that, that proves the rule, but many economists think it really signals a very different perspective. And so when you look at the current global financial crisis, we did not actually see a significant downturn in emissions. What we really saw, and I'll come back to this analytically later on, we saw a huge shift. Great deals of manufacturing in East Asia and in Japan, in Korea, in the United States and Europe, actually shifted to, um, to, to manufacturing in China in a huge way, and we've all talked about the massive amount of money in the banks in China right now, the, uh, the six to seven trillion dollars worth, and that was funded by a combination of frequently discussed low wage labor in China, but also very low fossil fuel prices uh, using coal. And so communities around the world, from Scandinavia to California to Boulder, Colorado to New York, that are thinking about ways that they are going to reduce their carbon footprint. Basically, no one is yet looking at what I personally believe will be the next wave, and that is you can't find ways to uh, sustainably ratchet down the emissions and pollution from your own economy and then happily import as much fossil fuel intensive products from around the world. You can do it, but it's not an honest piece of accounting. And as a physicist, I find it funny that maybe one of my biggest messages today in terms of methods the next generation of students is really we need to make our methods of accounting and analysis dramatically upgraded to think about these kinds of issues. And that's really where I'll be going today. So when I think about the threats to sustainability, the kind of picture of them won't be any surprise, but it kind of highlights we have interest and desires for, for better well-being, we have demand for good services, there's an energy footprint or an impact of those choices. Those, reloaded, those relate to not only local pollution, but also global greenhouse gas impacts, global greenhouse gas the um, <coughs> atmosphere has many effects on our economy. Um, there's a variety of negative impacts there on oceans, and, and this is a place where one talks all the time about changing ocean chemistry as a direct result of greenhouse gas impacts. We have reduced well-being. Um, so these things all relate together. Each one of these could be broken in different ways, from conservation using less to being efficient, to um, carbon-free energy, uh, two that I'm not massive fans of myself, but we can debate uh, in the Q&A, carbon capture and storage, um, geoengineering, both of, me, so both of them to me seem either very defeatist or ways actually to, to not really change the economy in ways that make sense. We can adapt to these changes. The one line I haven't drawn in here, so these, these categories often get looked at in terms of mitigation options, interventions, and I'm clearly not an interventionist because uh, I've uh, given a negative spin to at least those two, and then adaptation. And the one line I haven't highlighted, the one up here, uh, <coughs> reduced well-being, well, that's called suffering. Um, and so you can break that, but one feature of suffering that we don't talk about that much is that we have ample evidence, not only in poor developing countries, but in the US, that when we mean suffering, we invariably mean suffering at least first, and often most extensively by the poor. There's lots and lots of examples that when we mean things will get worse, we mean the poor will take the brunt of that. We have ways to, um, to ameliorate those that, as, as, as if we're more well off. And so there's a real economic and climate and environmental justice issue that needs to be part of the equation. And I'll come back to this many times because many of our most innovative new technologies and products are ones that are initially much more affordable by the, uh, by the rich, we have the early adopter syndromes and early adopter syndromes and also the acronym adopters. And so there's a number of features of that story that we need to keep in mind and they tend to leave the equation very regularly. We tend to forget about them a lot and that's something we can't do. If we simply recreate a new energy economy with a, with a range of different sources of energy and this remains something where the rich dramatically over benefit relative to the poor, we really haven't addressed a number of the other underlying I won't spend the bulk of today's lecture talking about climate change. This is an exceptionally educated community on climate change. But I do want to highlight it because uh, Michael introduced me as a member of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or when I gave a talk two nights ago in Bellingham, I was introduced as a member of the Intergalactic Panel. <laughs> which sounded much cooler, but I have to admit uh, it was not, uh, not quite accurate. Um, so
So I'm not going to I'm not going to try to give. And I know you've had people giving exceptionally good lectures on climate change, the science and is, uh, issues around it. But there is one aspect of the story where, again, because our slides are available for those who want them, part of the failing of the scientific community, failing in terms of getting the message across to the public, failing politicians who want to utilize this information, is finding ways not to argue through every last bit of the science of climate change, but to tell fairly terse versions of what is the state of the science. The way that often gets done is to argue back and forth, and whenever I go on a TV show or radio or something, they always say, oh, even though the world scientists are massively aligned around agreement around the scientific story, we still have to bring on a skeptic because otherwise it wouldn't be a so-called fair debate. And that enrages scientists all the time. You say, why do I have to go on you know, against Bjorn Lomborg or against, um, against Bill O'Reilly? Why do I have to go on to that when the science is so clear? Well, we like debates. The science is not as clear as one thing, not in terms of the science of climate change, but in terms of the science of actions. And so what I frequently get is, oh, the story is so complicated. It's this huge mass of debates. And that's true. And the most common scientific response is quite reasonable, but it falls incredibly short. It tends to be some version of a graph or a story like this. What you see across the bottom um, in green there is the change in the atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases going back, in this case, 400,000 years. We have some geologists in the room, but I've never quite understood why geologists like to plot it going up. Uh, going from left to right or right to left, but it just, uh, it's just an interesting convention for me. Um, but it tends to be, here's the natural variability going back a long way. It's a geologic record you can trust. And where we are, or where, we're, where we were in 2005, is a, is a bump above that. And the projections by 2100 scenario A1, F1, or something else, is that we'll be way up here in the year 2100, and that's terrible. This is why Al Gore got on the accordion thing on stage in his movie. And this is all entirely accurate. But for my mind, it does something which is really very difficult to get across, and that is the historic record is true, but we don't observe it directly. And what's going to happen in terms of 2100 is based on models and forecasts. And that gets you into tricky territory, even for a reforming or recovering theoretical physicist like myself. <coughs> so what I'm going to show you instead is the current version of that story that I most like to show. I'm going to show you a movie, a very short, few second movie, and what it's going to, what it's going to um, overlay is the amount of sea ice over the North Polar cap at the time of year, and it varies a little bit season to season, late August, early September, of minimum sea ice. And it's going to be a movie of that, and then overlaid on that is going to be that those numbers just plotted out. And so you'll see in millions of square kilometers what is the amount of sea ice going back to 1980. So here we are back in 1980, between 6 and 7 million square kilometers of ice during the summer minimum. Um, the numbers bounce along. There was just a very important report on the Antarctic numbers produced last week by the University of Washington uh, team. And of course, there's, there's variability in this. I mean, there, there, there are big excursions up and down. Um, but as we move forward in time, it's a really frightening record to me. Because even if you throw out the extremes, which you should, um, and there's an extreme high in, the, in, in 96, and there's an extreme low in 2007. What you see overall during this 30 year record is a reduction in roughly half of the summer sea ice. Dramatic changes both to the Arctic region, but also to the world fish population, to temperature fluxes, a variety of features. And I showed this record because there is no modeling involved. This is a purely empirical record. In the region of the world that we know is most sensitive, to environmental change, and so it really highlights the story. Now, one version of what do we do about this was that, well, we are burning through our fossil fuel resources very quickly, and while that makes the problem worse, it also will get us more interested in transitions. And so M. King Hubbard, a number of other geologists began to examine what's now called the Hubbard's curve. It's really a bell <coughs> curve, highlighting the rise in the production from a non-renewable resource, and then the inevitable fall. And there's no surprise that the model that, that, that M. King Hubbard and colleagues came up with was that of roughly a bell curve. You rise up smoothly, and then you fall down smoothly. The rough shape of the global curve is along those lines. The yellow at the bottom is the US. We peaked in our 
domestic production of, of, of oil in the 70s, and you see it for other parts of the world. <coughs> and what you'll notice, though, right off, is that while this has roughly that belt-shaped belt curve, it's not exact, and in fact, it's got a long tail that's been tacked on for a variety of reasons. The Middle East was one part of it, but also you'll notice um, there's heavy oils, the dark line, third from the, fourth from, third from the top, and then the deep water oil, and actually, I was at a meeting uh, run by an oil company that I won't name, Chevron. And <laughs> at this meeting, and the, the uh, scientist from Chevron is a very high quality scientist, um, and he said with a straight face, our current forecasts of warm Arctic waters by 2020 mean that it will be easier to extract uh, polar oil. <laughs> and I had a hard time. Um, no, it was a room where I couldn't take what he said, but I really wish, wish I had been able to, because that was just a remarkable both admission and then business plan based on those changes, because extracting more resources. And so while the idea that we use <laughs> roughly half of the world's conventional oil is true, and that sometime in the coming decades we will be winding down dramatically, the problem is that for an economy that's really got serious addiction issues around our current energy economy, not that they're fossil fuels, but that we are addicted to that which we're used to for a variety of reasons, they're not very surprising, but that the asymmetry, the extra resources that we're adding on here on the right side of this picture are a real worry. And they're a worry because while it's true we've used roughly, very roughly, half of the world's conventional oil, there's lots of other resources out there, and there's been many discussions here and elsewhere about things like the Canadian tar sands, I recently served on the Canadian National Research and Development Commission to look at their different resources, and I think they like most of the things I did, except for that I have this habit of calling them tar sands, and the new official term in Canada is oil sands, because that's uh, deemed to sound better. Um, and these are three major basins of oil sands in Canada, um, and the, the, the key bottom line in the story is that there's more oil in this solid form, the form of bitumen, in Alberta than there was oil in Saudi Arabia before they began pumping. So in the last three seconds, we have just discovered, if you will, another Saudi Arabia worth of oil. It's in a strange form. It's in a solid form. Actually, my host in um, Canada said, well, you know, there's lots of reasons why we like this, one of which is that it, it, it has the consistency of a hockey puck um, until you refine it. One of the real perverse aspects of the energy economy, not Canada's fault, actually we're more to blame in this than they are, is that one of the issues of getting oil out of this, uh, this solid form is it has a very high sulfur content. And so ironically, the chemical refining process to turn this vitamin into oil really highlights many of the most worrying aspects of the equation. One is that Alberta also has a great deal of natural gas, something we'll talk about quite a bit as we go on. To get the sulfur out of this material, the most convenient way is a process where you basically bubble warmed natural gas, carbon with four hydrogens, through this material, and the carbon switches off and the sulfur binds on preferentially. And so you get a compound for which you can then cool it, quench it, and you can get the sulfur precipitating out. And these are the piles of sulfur around Fort McMurray. The world's sulfur market is flooded, as you might imagine. Um, and unfortunately, there's a very large water footprint, too. And so this is not Lake Athabasca in the background. This is actually a settling pond for the waste materials. And as I mentioned, there's more oil in this form in, uh, in Alberta. And Alberta is not the only place with tar sands deposits. They've known about tar sands since 1890s. You can go and see some of the real old um, ex um, exploration places. But it wasn't economically feasible because it took a lot of energy, a lot of energy to separate out the oil. You can see all the infrastructure around here to do so. In fact, the energy penalty or the energy cost to produce a barrel of oil from oil sands, from tar sands, is about $35. And so obviously when the price of oil was less than $35, which it was most of the 90s, it didn't make sense. So the tar sands sat on the ground. Now that the price of oil is much higher, it makes a great deal of sense. And again, Venezuela has large reserves, and now it looks like there are significant reserves in Africa. There's a number of places where they could do the same process. So one worry is that we've just discovered another huge 
mass of oil resources, but not in, um, not in conventional form. So I will now show one sort of technical, complica I mean, complicated graph. Not that, uh, not that this audience would do it, but that it takes a bit of time to go through. So let me describe um, briefly why oil sands worry me greatly, not just because of oil sands, but because it is symptomatic of the fact that the peak oil story is wrong. This graph is my one-slide history of the world's liquid fuel economy. That's the whole thing. Let me explain what I mean. When you burn oil in your vehicle, you produce about 20 grams of greenhouse gases per megajoule, per million joules of energy out. That's the dash line. So everything below the line here is the amount that's more or less constant no matter what kind of car you drive. That's about how much you produce for that much energy. And yes, there's more efficient, efficient vehicles, but that's an average. The entire human history of oil is this little line right here. What I mean by that is that we have consumed as a society a little over a thousand um, a billion barrels of oil. And below this line is how much we burned on the road. And above this line, between 20 and this number here, about 28 grams of greenhouse gases per megajoule, that's the energy required to refine it. That's kind of the baseline. That's conventional oil. If we utilize enhanced oil recovery, pumping compounds into oil wells, carbon dioxide, water, other things, to force more oil out, no surprise, there is an extra energy cost to do so. Right? There's an extra energy that's required to do so. So enhanced oil recovery expands our resources, but it also comes with a little higher cost per barrel. And while the line from here to here shows what we've used, the peak oil story is there's about this much more in the light brown, it's kind of the uncertainty. So enhanced oil recovery means that we're dirtier per barrel and that we've given ourselves more of a resource. Tar sands is even more costly per unit of energy. So the line goes up and you can see the, it adds to the resource. Turning gas into a liquid, we know how to do. And that adds quite a bit of resource, but it's a little cleaner than tar sands, but it's, it's more, a little more complicated. So it adds to the resource here. And we can also turn coal into liquids. And a huge worry is that one of the next looming Albertas with oil sands, if you will, is actually Utah. Because they have, they have, um, uh, they have oil shale that can be turned into liquids as well at a higher energy cost. So this graph should worry you both that we've gone from that's what we've used, that's what we have, now we've added all of this stuff, but then each barrel we're getting at is dirty. So the bottom of the barrel gets larger and larger, not smaller, and it gets dirty. And there's lots of analysis of how dirty each one is. There's, there's a lot of different life cycle or cradle to grave analysis. But this really highlights that we should be worried both ways over, and it brings me back to the one, of the, one of the most hackneyed but really useful statements, and that is the Minister of Oil in Saudi Arabia, a place now investing significantly um, in both solar and nuclear, is that he highlighted a comment that gets frequently used, and that is the Stone Age didn't end for a lack of stones. <laughs> Our resource is huge, and the question is, how are we going to drive the transition? The volume of oil in these forms is enough that we don't need to drive that transition, or we won't drive it, because of the amount of oil resources. It's going to have to come from other means. Environmental crises, social awareness, a whole variety of features. One thing I want to highlight is that the story of the so-called oil or resource curse, meaning communities that have large amounts of these resources, Frequently told about Middle East countries as well, how bad they are in terms of poor democracy and poor this and that, fueled by uh, fuel, fueled by cheap oil, a line that um, Tom Friedman has called the first law of petropolitics. The more oil the, you have and the more valuable it is, the less you will sort of be responsive to your citizens. That is hardly a, a feature of the Middle East alone. When you look at the demographics, the quality of life, the health issues, the out-migration from places like West Virginia with a coal-driven, dominated economy, we see the same story. So it is not at all unique to the Middle East, and it really highlights 
a system where the transitions are going to have to be ones that we drive because communities like this, uh, nations and regions decide for other reasons than the amount of resource, we're going to have to do things differently. All of that leads us to thinking about different kinds of alternatives. And this is both where the story gets, I would say, even more interesting and even more complicated. Part of what we're going to need is not just committed communities, but places that are willing to help develop new metrics and tools. And so a, a program that I was involved with at Berkeley um, co uh, competed for the world's largest individual research grant. It was a $500 million grant given out by BP at the point when BP was changing its name from British Petroleum to Beyond the Petroleum. <coughs> BP has now changed its name back again. Now they're BP or British Petroleum. And we were successful in partnership with, with uh, the Federal Laboratory in Berkeley, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, that our Secretary of Energy, Steve Chu, directed before moving to DC, and the University of Illinois at Urbana. Uh, we were successful in winning this grant and looked at a lot of different aspects of biofuels. And as many of you know, the biofuel story is far from simple. And the positive and negative impacts of biofuels are very complicated. Uh, we wrote an, an, uh, an early paper analyzing the life cycle story here, um, and it was one that, that ethanol can contribute, and there was a lot of discussion in the paper about what that can meant. We provided an analysis of when it can help and when it can't, um, and that part of the process of figuring this out was one that we worked very hard with a range of ecologists, and I'm really pleased to have written a paper with a whole number of the world's top ecologists in highlighting the many negatives in terms of impact on food and on tropical forests, and it gets to be a more and more complicated story. And after we wrote these two papers, it was the only time I've ever been called on the same day by both the advisor to the Democratic and the Republican candidate for president asking for the same thing. And so we, we <laughs> described in detail what the positives and many negative aspects of biofuels were. I went on 60 Minutes to talk about these kinds of issues. And it really highlighted a very complicated story where doing the cradle-to-grave analysis was absolutely vital to understanding these issues. And the number of scholars and the number of people elected officials and teams that have people ready to think about not only the, the basic economics of energy, but also the biodiversity, the health, the other impacts is critical. And that gets back to that point I had in the first slide, that doing these analyses a new way of thinking through our energy systems is really part of the story. And those of you who follow the detailed aspects of, for example, the, of the deep water horizon spill, know that when you think about an offshore well now, you're no longer thinking about a system with one pipe underground. In fact, you're thinking about pictures like this, where individual exploration vessels are doing incredibly sophisticated and complicated things. And so the reason why the deep water uh, accident in the Gulf was so hard to cap was that we weren't talking about a simple pipe. We were talking about, about a pipe and a system that went through a mile of seawater and then went through a mile and a half, not straight down, through rock and mud. These are systems on the edge of technology, and risks in those systems are high, and finding ways to manage those are one where we're critically undermanned and underwoman in this process. The story I've described about the peak of oil is not at all unique to oil. There are peak graphs for coal as well. Um, and when we look at the global resources and what's going on, it, there's also a process here. And so I'm not going to weigh in, uh, fully into, into, the, into the Cherry Point debate you're having here. But one of the issues that really worries me is that when I look at processes that would think about massive exports of coal, even before you get to the environmental aspects of that story, one of the real worries is that a strong driver, to put this in, is international, in parentheses, funding of projects like this to the tune of several billion dollars to extract a resource to which everyone is already looking at where the peaking point of this curve may be. And communities on the receiving or on the handling end of these uh, of these downward uh, trending resources are the places, no matter how profitable, that are going to receive the largest share of the environmental damages. 
When you're ramping up production of resources, whether it's oil for sperm whale, from sperm whales, or oil in the peak oil story, or coal, on the rising side of the equation as technologies are evolving and extraction tends to be relatively easy, that's not where you see the really huge social and environmental other costs. It's on the downside when you're fighting to maintain production, when you get to more and more extreme methods, when the effort, if you will, gets higher, that's where the story gets more and more challenging. The largest single change in the U.S. coal industry in five decades happened in the last six months. This is U.S. coal production going back to the mid-70s. 18% drop in U.S. coal production over the last half year. Unprecedented change, largely because coal is being seen by many, many U.S. investors as far less viable than, I'd like to say wind, and wind has played a very small few percent impact, but the real driver is gas. And the perspectives now of new technologies and harvesting very larger amounts of gas from so-called tight formations, including but not limited to fracking, is a place where the U.S. is driving dramatic changes. Right now, the price of gas and the forecast for gas availability is very low in the U.S. Very high availability, very low price. We have an arbitrage situation. The price of gas is nowhere near this low yet in Europe, largely dependent on Russian gas, and in China. But this is a matter of technology and time, not of some long-term difference where we will have cheap gas forever and um, and, the, and, and Asian societies and Europe will not. So one of my real worries about pushing out on industrial development and job creation around coal is that this situation of a reduction in interest in coal relative to gas, even before you get to environmental and social issues, is a very strong driver. One of the ways that we've tried to make the story of what are the costs clear is to build what are so-called waterfall diagrams. And so one aspect of this, done in this case for coal, is to be as clear as we can about what are the full costs of various resources. And to do it in a way that players in this discussion, from community groups to industrial teams, can look at the numbers and decide which aspects they want to push for and which ones they don't. So here's a picture where the cost of, of, of coal, the so-called overnight uh, lease, you know, right, Pure economic cost is the bottom in blue. Depending where you are, five to 11 cents. There's land impacts, there's emissions from mine, there's health impacts, there's air pollution. Um, in this analysis, we came up with a number fully worth uh, debating that the actual costs are really between eight and about 26 cents per kilowatt hour. We did this analysis, um, Mayor Bloomberg took a look at it and promptly gave $40 million to Sierra Club because he thought the piece that should be highlighted was the air pollution and the health story. And so this series of ads that those of you, I uh, hope many of you have seen, um, is that the filter for air pollution from coal is in many ways ourselves. And of course they pick you know, cute young kids, et cetera, et cetera, but they highlighted these impacts as part of the story. And this is a, again a crit critical part of the picture that one wants to look at. So what I want to do in the end is to use the remaining time to talk through a range of solutions. And instead of detailed technical versions of these, all of which are online on the website, I want to highlight a variety, a very diverse set of communities that have made dramatically different choices in this regard. The place I began, this is actually where I grew up in Ithaca, New York. Um, Ithaca was very worried about finding ways to value people's times across different skill sets. And so what Ithaca chose to do um, was a program that is now unfortunately fading a bit but was to have a local currency that valued your time based on <clears throat> hours spent working, not based on the fact that the hourly wage that a plumber or a day neighbor can get is dramatically different than, say, a brain surgeon. It was to value time and effort in terms of units of time and to allow these so-called Ithaca hours <clears throat> to be traded not only in the farmer's market, but through strong efforts by a number of community groups uh, you could pay a quarter of your mortgage, you could pay a quarter of the price of a new car bought in town in these units. And again, it's only one approach, but it's one that really opened my eyes to the process of what can we do in this regard. So again, I'll use my last little bits 
to highlight a few very diverse community stories highlighting this aspect of the picture. What can we do differently? And the one I'll start with is a community in French Polynesia. I highlighted for a couple reasons. One, it was, a, it was a request by a celebrity client to turn this motu or atoll that he, or, that he owned um, in French Polynesia, you can see the airstrip right here, into a 100% green island community that they were developing. And I initially took it on because who can resist the chance to go to French Polynesia? But I had no initial prospects that this was a really important leading edge research program. This is a place where the academics, I think, need to, look, need to learn much more from those involved in the doing. So we went there and began to work on a design process. You can see here are some of the buildings. There's a science center. There's a community center. There's a number of things around the island. And this is the airstrip that that subject client, Marlon Brando, and his sons actually carved out. So we, had, we were asked to develop a low carbon plant. The plant that we developed is now 95% complete. They're still doing a few of the buildings. But much of the energy project is done. There's a very large solar array that goes, well, that's next to the runway. And it turns out they work for quite a while to find a solar panel that can be put flat down in the area and planes could drive across it with no damage. A lot was learned about which solar materials could utilize that. Flexible, softer, um, but a little lower efficiency thin films were chosen because you can lay them out in ways that you can drive your private or even larger planes back and forth across it. We also put in a biofuel facility using coconut shells, and the island now buys up coconut shells from neighboring islands and uses it for the fuels for the, for the vehicles. Um, and a technology which I hope some of you get a chance to look at. Those of you who've gone to Bora Bora um, and stayed in some of the resorts there have actually used it. It's so-called salt water air conditioning, where you pump up very cold deep ocean water, in this case, five and a half degrees seawater, for about a kilometer down. You use it as a heat exchanger, the air conditioning. If you've been to Bora Bora, I should have to show of hands. Uh, it's a wonder, it works wonderfully well. Um, and then you, then you then send back the seawater, back in this case about 140 meters deep, where the temperature is equal to the temperature afterwards. Incredibly well working system, 90% reduction in fossil energy. They also have a very large high tech battery, the so called flow battery. Um, that gives them several days of full storage even if everything is not working. And the one piece of the system that has not been installed yet, not because they don't have the money, but because the company is not ready to ship it, is actually one where I learned the most. Uh, they purchased from the Carnegie Energy Company um, in Perth a system that the tank anchored to the ocean floor is filled with fresh water. And the difference in buoyancy means this thing moves back and forth. They generate energy, they pressurize the piston. And the piece of the story that came as a real practical revelation to me was that we were looking at the design plans and the pressure in, in the cylinder that generates energy, but it turns out this system has a high pressure that it uses to run the system, but the low pressure output end turns out to be high enough to run a reverse osmosis system. The island gets its fresh water with the waste pressure from this system, and of course fresh water is critically valuable on lots of islands. And this is a piece of a story that none of us have thought of in advance. This was purely an observation. We have this 24, 24 bar pressure coming out. It's enough to do reverse osmosis. Let's do it. I'll conclude with one other example, both because it's a community where you wouldn't think of being a climate leader, but also it's one where the story is wonderful to one extent, but it opens up a very complicated set of choices, all of which need this interactive dialogue and these new metrics. And I'm going to pick a far off a place in some level, and it's actually the Malaysian province of Sabah, the former British North Borneo. And I highlight this because what happened in this, in this case was a, 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 a series of environmental groups called me up one day, about three years ago, and they said, we have a situation here. And they said, and that is that because the quality of power is very poor across North Borneo. The capital of the province is here, Kota Kinabalu. Um, and Sabakan over here has very poor power quality, lots of outages. We need new energy. The utility for Sabah and the central government uh, based in Kuala Lumpur, Prince of Malaysia, have decided and have already purchased a coal plant from China. 
And coal is available from Indonesia, from the southern part of the island, and the contract's been signed. I said, okay. That sounds bad. I said, we want you to do something about it. I said, well, you just told me all the contracts were signed. After a long conversation, the very uh, charismatic leader of the group convinced me to come look at it, even though I really had no thought there was something to do, because everything looked like it was a done deal. Well, the first thing that we kind of discussed in the process brings us back to where I began with Norway. Norway, concerned very heavily about deforestation, has chosen Borneo as its major investment to stop deforestation. Norway has offered the Indonesian government a billion dollars if they will develop a sustainability plan to stop converting forests into a variety of crops, but primarily palm oil. And that billion dollars was about to be delivered. Norway has decided to hold up on the payment until the sustainability plan goes through a, an international review. And Indonesia initially didn't like the idea, but they're now okay with it. And so what I noticed is that, well, the coal that's going to go to Sabah comes from Borneo, it comes from Indonesian um, part of the island, so-called Kalimantan. And then it doesn't really look very good if you're going to export coal as part of your sustainability plan for the island. And actually, the, the Indonesians sort of perked up at this point, even though, of course, cutting out the forest would be far more valuable than a billion dollars, a billion dollar check from Norway turned out to be pretty appealing. So we did an analysis of the options. I met with the utility. Initially, they said, you can talk to us all you want, but we've already decided what to do. Um, we talked to um, the, the, the current palm oil uh, growers on, um, in Sabah. We talked to the government that was very critically concerned that the palm oil plantations were giving them both a bad international rap, which I'm not sure how critical that was, but also was now cutting dramatically into the remaining um, areas where the orangutans live, where they've been working hard to promote ecotourism. And Malaysia's been working with other governments in the area to make this part of the ocean the so-called coral triangle for ecotourism. None of this sat well with the coal story. We did an analysis and found that through a great deal of efficiency, better transmission lines, a little bit of, of microhydro, et cetera, et cetera, and using the waste from those palm oil plantations, there was more than enough energy. Now, what did the papers pick up? The paper said, U.S. professor says biomass can replace coal. And I both was pleased and shuddered at this. Because this looks like a lot of an endorsement of that palm deforestation. What in fact actually happened in the fine print in this paper that I'm sure all of you read, the North Borneo, or the Borneo Post, <laughs> was that all of the current producers of palm oil had agreed and signed a no new palm oil land declaration. Right now, there is currently no new expansion of palm oil because of this declaration. Can I be sure this will, this will be maintained in the future? Absolutely not. Part of that story is how does one work through the opportunities to build an ecotourism story, more sustainable crops, a whole variety of things. An interesting closing point, and so this story is not, is not fully done, but it, it, at this point, the coal plan has been canceled. Um, Malaysia has, whoops, I jumped a slide over here, sorry, there it is. Um, Malaysia uh, um, has decided to go ahead with using natural gas and the palm waste and its efficiency and wind and, uh, and solar and a little bit of wind, and this is a plan that they're promoting right now as a, as, a, as a new development plan for the region. Interestingly enough, a project that I worked on in my final days at the World Bank was the case of Kosovo. Kosovo is sitting on a massive mound of coal. You can see some of it here. I've actually never seen such low quality coal. When you walk through the coal mine, it really looks like you're walking through a bunch of uh, felled trees. You can see the, uh, the, the coal here. And Kosovo is working on a plan either to build a new, much larger coal plant. They currently operate Europe's dirtiest fossil fuel plant. The first place the Kosovar university and NGO groups went to talk about what are their options in this regard was actually the community in Malaysia that three years before had no energy expertise and were now not only the proud owners of the sustainable uh, plan for Saba, but are now working with Indonesia on a program called the Heart of Borneo. 
and that is to conserve cross-border as a way to share these processes and hopefully to make this no new palm oil story stick. So I end very intentionally with a story that is by no means solved. We've had a wonderful short-term victory in Malaysia. We've worked on lots of new metrics and methods to do the analysis. But this is one where I fear, or I don't fear, that the benefit of a success is that really just an opportunity for ongoing vigilance and innovation. So when I said in the beginning, I really meant that the, the benefit of working through new metrics and new tools is to be a long-term partner with civil society and with industry. And I, of course, cannot guarantee that we will maintain and sustain all these stories. I sure hope we do. The climate story we ran through for the first uh, two-thirds of the, of the talk today about the resource issues, the peak oil, the unconventional fuels, really highlights the critical need to do so. But this is a story where it's much more of an ongoing analytic and political and community conversation than some clear endpoint where you can defeat the coal plant in Malaysia or defeat a coal terminal here and be sure you've won. It's a much more of an ongoing part of the story. The academic side need to really ramp up not only the tools that we provide, but also the engagement to make it happen. Because clearly, this is not just about the metrics, it's about finding all the ways to make these stories work. And that's, sorry, I'm on the wrong final slide. I went on the way, I see. Um, and that's where I want to sort of move from the talk part of the comments to the conversation. And once again, thank you all. I look forward to talking about this further. Thanks so much. I wonder what you're doing thinking that creates a person like you at graduating in 1935. <laughs> ah, I wish that was true. The real story is the class of 35 from UC Berkeley provided the money to support the chair that I have. So it's a bit of academic nomenclature. I can only wish. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I think the, the, the real answer, though, is that there's been a, a, a really amazing history of students who have enlivened these conversations and have done remarkable things. And as much as faculty would like to think that they drive the show, the economic analysis is the, the critical resource is actually innovative students, not faculty. Uh, we have one example, we have two examples in the front right here with Chris and Chong um, from Orcas Island. But the amount, and um, I can't quite see there, but if, um, if Gil Masters is here as well, the critical role that, ah, there's, okay, the, the really critical role of not only keeping one young, not class of 35 young, but young, that the new students do, I think is the most important part of the story. And things five years ago that I thought I would never study end up getting pushed on me in really interesting ways because the students figure out what they think are the most critical issues. And if you don't keep up, you don't get to do the most fun projects. And that's really the part of the, uh, you know, the longevity aspect uh, that I think is the most important in this, and it's where the students play the most interesting role. Uh, David Coburn. If I understood you correctly, uh, you're suggesting that new technologies means that there'll be uh, no apparent decrease of fossil fuels in the next 20 or 30 years, at least I'm uh, not taking into account other than uh, straight economic considerations. Um, does that also mean that the struggle uh, for um, information for the general public is going to become even more difficult when there's no um, obvious change in the availability of the fossil fuels? Yeah, let me, let me, I agree with that. Let me kind of rephrase it in the way I was trying to say here. And that is the resource of polluting fuels, both liquid and solid, is so large that it's going to take other drivers. That we could very, I don't want to say happily, but we could very easily, no matter how much wind and solar are growing in isolated pockets like here or the remarkable story in Denmark, um, where they ramped up to 20% wind, or in Germany, where they did something that 10 years ago would seem unheard of. Germany received, two months ago, on, on a sunny day, 50% of all electricity from solar 
the technology that many people think is the farthest from being a major player because of cost and deployment. But on a peak day, not averaging over the day, 50% from solar, that those remarkable cases are going to remain the exception, not the rule, unless we find other drivers. Now, it's not just that there's all these resources. We have lots of communities that are deciding for a variety of reasons that they're not going to facilitate more coal. A place that doesn't get anywhere near the credit that it should have for what it did 15 years ago is Idaho. Idaho then said no new coal plant, not because of a global warming push, but because of the local issues around mercury pollution. And you almost never hear this one. Now, Idaho has since retracted that law, unfortunately, but you get all kinds of interesting features. So there's lots of drivers, but what I'm getting at is that it's as much as we innovate technologically, we're going to have to innovate socially and in terms of the network aspects of the story, the overall costs and benefits to, to make this transition happen. And the transition we're talking about, you know, to put it in no starker terms, is that the 150 years or so it took to ramp up our industrial economy, where we're more or less 80% fossil fuel and 20% clean or cleaner energy, we have to reverse that 150 years with all of the embedded infrastructure over the next 30 or over the next 40 years. We need to go from 80 20 to 20 80 or better, having a second industrial revolution in a period of time massively compressed from the first one. And so it's going to take these other types of drivers or the economics of the fossil economy are going to overwhelm that process. <laughs> okay. okay, my question really has to do with Malaysia and, and um, given that when you talk about the economics of, of fossil fuel as opposed to some alternative, in Malaysia, you, uh, Malaysia is the world's largest coal exporter as I understand according to the, the World Coal Association uh, report says being well, I don't think so, but I, I'd love to, I mean, I'll check if that's the case. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's I, I've just been looking at the statistics yeah. recently. I believe Australia is, but um, I thought Australia, Australia was second. Okay, we'll, 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 we'll check, so, okay. Yeah, I mean, this was a, a switch. Um, but then, in that case, isn't it, even as the second largest coal exporter, isn't that a case of the, the, the capital benefit or the income benefit from the sale of coal export? Uh, doesn't that supersede the use of it internally? Yeah, so this is a, I mean, there's a whole number of interesting things in the statement, and I tried to allude to some of these with the Nor Norway story at the beginning. Norway right now, financially, is the largest donor in terms of clean energy development projects on the planet. Norway's financial resources to do so are oil and gas. And so we do not have a simple equation in terms of Norway, which is domestically powered by hydropower, very low carbon internal economy, is using all those resources for export. And so if the crux of, of what you're getting at is, it's not just the cost-benefit trade-off, it's where the resources come from the store. Um, it turns out that the, the real resource in, let me just jump ahead to it, where I put the picture of, um, uh, it turns out that the, 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 the key resource for Saba is not coal. There's basically none there, but they do have offshore gas. Um, and the neighboring province, Sarawak, um, has a very large amount of gas. And so what one does with those resources has to be part of that equation. Part of what I tried to open with was that if we, in fact, only do a process where we get sustainable at home, but we're happy to import products that, are, that have a very large environmental impact, we're not making any net, process, no, no, any net progress. Norway is one that this debate is played out daily. Um, California right now is working hard on what form of taxation will it do for imported, for, for fossil fuels embedded in products that it imports. And in fact, the, I'll, I'll jump to a slide to highlight it. The decision in California was to build a series of resource calculator tools where the carbon embedded in goods and services is reported out at the level of households and municipalities and 
state resources are tied to how much you, uh, you move yourself into the low carbon fraction. So not everyone can be above average, but the communities that are going to be preferentially receiving state support are those that have developed and are actually implementing lower carbon plans. There's no easy answer to, do you clean your own economy, but at the same time export a fossil economy? The, the picture that California is trying is to literally draw a bubble over the economy and to chart resources in and resources out. And it's only the beginning of a process, so no easy solution to what you're getting at. But um, the doing the metrics and looking at where the benefits come with the process is at least where they're beginning. But no easy answer. John Beeson from Lopez Island. Um, I have two questions. I was wondering if you can comment on the jobs aspect of um, your know, different energy options because you know jobs is being one of the main justification for coal export from um, from brown here. And, and my second question is um, on China. I wonder, you know, China is a big player in terms of economic, uh, the economy and, and energy use. Do you have any perspectives on um, energy futures for China and, and how the how, how it might um, have implications for the U.S. and the rest of the world? So great, great question. So two aspects of that. Um, one is that. The job story does get used all the time. Um, my laboratory is very guilty. This is uh, data from an online jobs calculator that we've been producing and updating since 2004. Um, you can see the website of the calculator, <coughs> our lab address, rayalbert.edu slash greenjobs, where you can download the data, an Excel calculator tool. You can put in the mix of energy. It will tell you the jobs, both the overnight jobs to build facilities and also the long-term jobs. Um, and there's two aspects of this that I think are really critical. One is that study after study that looks at the jobs created per dollar invested or per unit of energy delivered consistently come up with a story like this, where the jobs benefit for energy derived from solar, from energy efficiency, from wind, are higher than those from fossil fuels. But that's not because those technologies are better in this job sense. It's really because you're building a new industry. If, you, if, if the solar industry was as mature as the oil or gas industry, the job benefit would be shrunk dramatically. So there's an analytic part of the story. How many jobs do you get from different investments? You know, if one could take the amount of money being proposed for Cherry Point, could you use it more effectively on a jobs basis <coughs> in renewable energy and electricity? Almost certain. The debate over the numbers, though, has become vicious. There are people who use assessments of the jobs actually in companies and the jobs that are reduced and the indirect jobs. It's become a real complicated model. But there's a much simpler and clearer part of that picture, and that is when you are spending your funds buying fuels as a fraction of the cost of a technology, it's a very different equation than when you're investing in people, training, new companies, intellectual capital. And so at one level, you don't even need a number at all here to know that if you buy a gas turbine, 70% of the money that will go into that over its lifetime is not going to be for human resources and hardware to buy the fuel. If you buy renewable energy and energy efficiency, well, we have a problem of needing to find ways to amortize a cost which is an upfront cost. You are investing in people and companies and innovation. And, uh, and, and the, the Nobel Prize that um, Bob Solo received for looking at what are the drivers of economic growth came very clearly to look that, that depending on what your economy, it can be 65, 85%, but that the bulk of economic growth came from innovation and technology. So part of the job story is that we're not finding ways to align these the investments we put in around those that will produce not just more jobs, but also more IP. The second part of the question, the China story, of course, is a hugely complicated one all by itself. 
On the one hand, China is currently the world's largest consumer of fossil fuels, consumer of energy, and the largest emitter of greenhouse gases. But on the other hand, China is currently the largest producer of solar panels and of wind turbines and of batteries for electric vehicles. China, if you will, is going in all directions at once. China's renewable energy industry is an export-oriented industry. And they have rapidly ramped up to this, to, 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 this, to this point. Now, it's also the case that China has a current uh, emerging five-year plan, which is not as green as many people would like, but is a remarkable set of steps forward. Their desire to reduce the pollution footprint of each yuan of GNP is very high. It's not as high as some of us would like, but it's significantly high. And China will have, by 2015, the most people living under a carbon cap of any country on Earth. In fact, more people will be living in provinces of China where there is a price on carbon than the rest of the world combined. Unless, of course, we move more quickly. So China is pushing both sides of this equation. Partially the worries about local health and environmental issues that were secondary in China are now becoming primary. The estimate is that 20 to 22 percent of Chinese agriculture is lost due to soil and plant issues due to pollution. When it's a cold day and power plant uh, and fossil fuel use goes up in China, hospital admits and deaths go up. And it's very clear on the graph. It's unambiguous. So China is in this very mixed position. One aspect of the story that kind of comes home is that um, a number of well, uh, the U.S. has put um, tariffs, very serious tariffs, on imported Chinese solar panels. I have argued this is a massive mistake. It's a massive mistake because the actual number of manufacturing jobs that come from solar panel production is quite low relative to the rest of the process. Installation, management, financing. The U.S. ironically hurt its own economy by putting the tariff on solar panels, because even though we don't like them dumping panels, and there's good evidence that some of the solar panels China sells are dumped, we generate a net job growth because of domestic jobs by importing those panels. Now there's other issues about the Chinese solar economy. One worry right now is that with the Chinese trying quite actively to undercut a number of innovative other solar companies, we may find ourselves in two or three years with a dramatic reduction of the number of companies. And we need an innovative and aggressive <coughs> economy to generate new innovations. So China plays a very mixed role in this regard, but it's one that I would much rather find more ways to have to compete than to make a tariff and regulate. And unfortunately, right now, the US opposition is much more of a tariff regulation. So, great question. My name is John, I'm a writer. I have a few questions. Two questions. One is, uh, what do you see um, as a future of ocean tide and wave energy? And, uh, and the other one is, um, I'd, I'd like you to comment on Scotland's goal of being you know, uh, 100% on renewable energy by 2020. Yeah. Um, so the ocean energy story is one that's interesting because for, for long periods of time, there was a couple small, globally small trial plants in, um, in Newfoundland and France, etc. We're now starting to see a real boom in this area. The, the challenge that we have some experts in the room, the marine environment is tough. And it's tough to do low cost, long lifetime marine facilities. We need to critically you know, find innovations and bring them in from shipping industry, from all kinds of areas, to work on these to make sure one can demonstrate long lifetimes and long reliable lifetimes and ones that are ecologically sound. Um, the technology I showed you here, this, this CETA technology from Carnegie, is to me very interesting because there's no turbine blades, there's no impellers, there's no internal blades, but they are technology that, as I said, hadn't been shipped yet. So, you know, finding ways to get those that are ecologically safe to take advantage of the very large amount of marine energy available and the real wonderful benefit of high, uh, of high density fluid water allows you to get a lot of energy out if you get the right technology in. We do not have anywhere near the R&D uh, footprint in this area we should have. Um, we've got some big companies, and again, we have some experts in the room, but it's an area where I would like to think, particularly because it can be both baseload and 
but much more predictable, an area where there's huge opportunities. The second part, places like, uh, like, um, um, like Scotland that have zero energy plans. Well, Sweden announced a few years ago, they had a zero energy plan by 2020 as well. They promptly backed away from it. Um, the Scottish plan is going to be hard unless they really do push very aggressively on both on land, wind, and ocean energy to really build up resources. Technically, it looks possible. I'm quite skeptical 2020 is a, is a logical point to put it. The European-wide plan for a Europe in 2050 free of fossil fuels is one that's much more in keeping with what we look at in terms of the modeling we do for the Western uh, states. Now, we have a similar model to the European Climate Foundation's model. That's the one that's called the Europe Carbon Free in 2050. And we actually find that if you plan well, this is something we don't do. In other words, if you plan your transmission corridors and you give clear signals to private developers that we are building transmission and it will get to where your good geothermal or wind or solar resource is, as opposed to let the private industry build it and maybe or maybe not we'll get transmission there when your plant is built, that if one does this in a coordinated way, 2030 to 2040 is a much more realistic time for the U.S. West as an overall unit to cut its emissions by 80%. And to do so with a smaller increase in price for electricity than is the current forecast of price increase, even with low cost electricity. And if those of you go to the, to the website of my lab, this is a project called Switch. We have a series of models around it. But what I'm basically saying is I think that the Scottish 2020 date is too aggressive, but the 2030, 2035 looks entirely reasonable based on good planning and a, and a really orderly transition, if you will. We've now been about 20 minutes, uh, and I think we'll go on another 10. But if anybody would like to leave, uh, this would probably be a good juncture. I'm going to give the mic to Jay up here in the back. Feel free to leave if you have an appointment or something. Thanks, Dan. Hey, uh, you had a slide about public health impact of fossil fuels and uh, Bloomberg's uh, efforts to cut down fossil fuel emissions. Uh, thinking about the tobacco industry and the research that preceded public policy changes to reduce smoking, and then things like excise taxes to further reduce smoking and cover the costs, the health impacts, um, they have one front group helping create confusion and slow down the transition to healthier public policies. The fossil fuel industry has over 40 front groups providing a lot of counter information to the science. My question is, um, the tobacco industry ended up settling for over $200 billion uh, in the master settlement agreement in the late 90s. Do you foresee for the fossil fuel industry sometime in the future where their privatization of the profit, but shifting the cost to the public, will be recovered through some sort of legal action. Uh, well, as much as I like her, Mother Nature has never sued anyone. She's just uh, swept one under. So I would like to see that as part of the dialogue around what are the ways to rebalance the equation. Um, I don't have enough of a crystal ball to see whether I think we'll get a large suit as, as, a, as, a, as one of the outcomes in the story. But I think that the feature that's, that's in some ways most concerning to me is that when you look at the collection of talent in terms of PhDs, economists, people involved in energy production around the world, the current so-called oil and gas or big energy companies have the huge lion's share of those technical experts. And most of my conversations, really, um, um, with the oil companies, focus around you are in the best position to be the broker of cleaner forms of energy and to be on the payment side if things like this settlement happen. Instead of finding, um, you know, finding a way to squeeze the last bit of oil out of those tar sands and oil sands. And that equation, again, it held sway briefly at BP when they put this $500 million investment into biofuels, again, a, a problematic fuel, to say the least. But when I talked to the, the CEO of BP a couple years ago, he said, you know, if we'd seen how little public pressure there was gonna be to go green, 
we never would have made that investment. Uh, I'd like to ask a question along those lines. Uh, what do you think about a coal tax, or as I like to call it, a coal fee, since the people in this audience are the owners of those um, coal fields in uh, Wyoming and Montana, their public lands. Given all the obvious scientific evidence for the negative impacts of coal, and should we be charging some, a tax or a fee on it, say $10 a ton to begin with, and divert that money to uh, mitigations into energy efficiency and renewable energy? Wouldn't this be a really good way to begin uh, having a tax on exported coal, such as Australia has, as a way to begin having a carbon tax? Not just Australia, India has a tax on coal, which in purchasing power parity adjusted dollars is about 35 US dollars a ton. And they put that into a mixture in R&D. The world's far fourth largest wind company, Suzlon, received a significant amount of money when they were ramping up from that coal fee. And what's ironic is that, you're right, we do not do it. So there's a, a proposition and California, as you probably know, has this somewhat quirky, to say the least, proposition process where all kinds of things, both good and bad, come up for the, come up for the ballot. And I was asked to co-chair the so-called Proposition 87 campaign. I was the so-called Democratic uh, chair, and Vinod Kosla was the Republican chair, a got clean tech uh, investor and innovator. And our proposition was exceedingly simple. It was, as I thought it was simple. Um, and that it's, it said the following, California at that point, the third largest producer of oil in the country, receives more money into the state revenues from hunting and fishing licenses than from a tax on, on oil produced in the state. This, the two states that produce more oil, Alaska and Texas, both have a tax on oil that goes into different uses of public funds. We should do the same in California. And to really make sure it was kind of insulated, what we said is that the price of oil rises too high, the tax will drop down. It's kind of a perverse thing. You could argue it should go up higher. But we said if the price of oil should really shoot up, this price, this tariff will, will go down. Um, and then there will be a floor. So this will, this will have a limited range, it will be a few percent tax. Um, and that this money will go into a mixture of, of money for the general fund, money for education, and money for new energy technology research and development. And the underpinning of our argument was one that I thought was ironclad. Both the Democrat and Republican chair and others thought so as well. And the public relations firm that we hired said it was far too complicated a message for Get. So I'll use you as a judge for that. First of all, we started off, as many propositions do, 25 points ahead. We lost 57 to 43, 53 to 47, and it was the campaign up until um, the anti-gay marriage campaign that had received the most money against of any proposition. And what, what, what was the basis of the argument was that California does not set the global price for oil. So there's no way that this price will impact us at the pump. This is a tax on that oil production, tax on, on, those, on, those, on those revenues, and that, that money is going to be recirculated to the economy. I thought that was an argument that with good PR messaging, we would be able to convey. We're not going to affect the local price. We're simply going to harvest some of that money and put it into a state that critically needs it. And the PR firm said that message was way too complicated to forget. <laughs> and you know, I, I don't know how well we would have done if we tried it, but that argument was never raised in public. Um, I did it once in a debate and got slapped by the campaign for, for getting into uh, complicated economics. <laughs> well, we're now at 30 minutes, but I think uh, there's enough interest that we're going to keep going on. Uh, Bill Anders, do you think there'd be a role for a new uh, nuclear reactor designs that would eat their own fuel and even the waste of current reactors? So, so interesting, interesting topic. Um, you know, I guess the baseline for those who don't follow what's going on in nuclear is a couple uh, trends, both interesting and worrisome. And as you heard in the beginning, I am a professor of nuclear engineering, 
although largely because I study risk. I am not a reactor engineer, I'm a, I'm a physicist. On the one hand, right now, the US hasn't built a new reactor of any type, um, either a breeder, as, you, as you're describing, or a conventional one, since the 80s. And actually, that plant, Watts Bar, was started in the 70s. So we have very little capacity in this regard, and even uh, universities that have significant nuclear engineering departments are quite worried about the, the technical capacity to build more than a few. There are, on the one hand, some significant um, uh, loan guarantees available for the companies that choose to build the next reactors, but at the same time, our national waste management plan, as just reviewed by the President's Blue Ribbon Commission, has chosen to say the Yucca Mountain facility that was going to be the natural repository is now in a, a strange limbo status. So we have subsidies to do, but not a plan at the end of life. And right now, new nuclear reactors, in the large traditional form, even some of the, even the new designs, are $10 billion investments that take up to 10 years to build. So there's a huge problem in terms of doing, even if you had a great design. The place where there's a lot more excitement in the US, remember where, uh, we're getting reactors built and more different designs in, um, in China, the Koreans have a major contract to build in the Gulf. Um, but in terms of the area where there's really huge excitement, largely on the investor side, are small modular reactors. Ones that are literally neighborhood size, whether they get placed in neighborhoods or not. Very exciting design, a picture that technologically looks, I uh, use Oppenheimer's words, looks sweet. A management question that I'm exceedingly worried about. And so, even with some of the most interesting new developments on a variety of reactor technologies, including these small ones, I'm not sure whether there are many takers to build. And what you describe is the system that was actually part of the initially envisioned system where reactors would consume their own waste, make more fuel, and that the amount that would have to go in repositories would be less and less. Well, we chose, um, under President Carter, not to reprocess. Our waste volume is very large, and our current waste solution space is poor as well. And so, my concern right now is that even if technologically uh, that system looks very attractive, and in many ways it does, we're not in a position to launch into a process to do it because we haven't even gotten integrated over the full life cycle of from fuels to management to where we would, where we would store it. And so I would like to say an unequivocal, this is going to work. Um, we are not in a, we are not in a good conversational point at the national level. In fact, several of those early reactors that were going to get those federal dollars because of lower demand than expected have actually pulled back in the orders to build even what's the next generation and bit reactors. So we're in a very odd place where answering that question is hard. Technologically, it looks very attractive. But the history of doing this in the nuclear field in the US has been very mixed. And we need to ramp up the capacity, not only on the research side, but also in terms of deploying even a next generation of reactors to get that experience back. So that, that was a very long roundabout way to describe a situation where we're in, I, I would call it nothing more than a big muddle as to what we're going to do next, as opposed to building a very small number of reactors and also different than current ones. And I think the last point on this is that we have just about 100 reactors operating in the United States right now. All of those reactors have to be retired over the next 25 to 30 years. Even for nuclear to replace its current fleet without building any more, so even if, of course their share would go down if you just replace those reactors because their energy demand is growing. Right now, the capacity to build those next 100 isn't there, let alone costs, local risk issues, and of course in California, building a new current nuclear reactor is illegal. Um, until there's a waste solution, the law in California says no new reactors. So we're in a very strange spot on uh, this technology, let alone the cost of this issue. Joe, I've been uh, avoiding you for a while. I'll let you. 
Hi, I'm Joe Simon. Um, it seems to me the elephant in the living room here that hasn't been talked about. Um, everything's about low carbon and, and some of the carbon fuel issues, but we haven't talked about the parts per million of carbon dioxide this is creating, and really that is really a placeholder for temperature increase, and the temperature increase is really a placeholder for um, called habitat degradation. And um, you know, if we kind of try to blow some of the smoke off the screen, which is to say it's been really informative about all these things, what's your assessment over the next 20, 30 years of the likelihood of we're going to have more Malaysia kind of success stories to lower that projected uh, parts per million, and therefore temperature, and therefore you know, habitat issues? So I said at the beginning, well, I wasn't going to do a climate lecture, so I didn't go through the full story on that. But the projected damages, ecologically and economically, are huge. Um, there was some really critical work that, that, that came out at large University of, University of Washington on um, ocean acidification is basically can boil down to, if you like uh, snorkeling and scuba diving, do it now. <laughs> because Tropical corals are projected to be gone by sometime in the 2030s, plus or minus a healthy range, uh, because we're going to change the pH um, of which tropical corals grow. For those of you who are hardier, like Arctic diving, you're fine. Uh, those corals will survive, but temperate corals are in absolute threat. So when you start to add up costs like that, you go way off scale in terms of what the impacts of doing nothing are. But your question was really about what do I think are the prospects to get more success stories? Um, I didn't go through it today. I actually think that for all of its many faults in terms of energy planning and argument, California is in a very interesting position. It is right now in a place where it has a very, very integrated plan where the carbon reduction plan for the state that calls for reducing emissions by 25% relative to today by 2020, California is on track to get that not because of a recession, but because the plan is working. California has been releasing new parts of that plan every day. You're now no longer allowed to build a new housing development or a mall unless the greenhouse gas and the water impacts of that decision are made. Last Friday, the governor put real teeth into a plan to put a million and a half electric vehicles on the road by 2025. It's actually larger than the federal plan, so it's interesting that it's, anyway. Um, but that I think the number of places likely to do this is quite high. And actually, this is a place where, if you look at Europe is currently living under a carbon pricing regime. The price is too low, in my opinion. They have too many permits, but they have a regime in place. California's first auction is next month. China is on a plan to have about 450 to 550 million people under a carbon price in the next few years. When you add all that up with Australia and Korea and elsewhere, we're talking about a little over one-seventh of the global population in both developed and developed countries living under a carbon pressure regime in the near future. So I'm actually very optimistic. A carbon price alone will not solve all these problems. But what I believe is that a carbon pricing regime is a fundamental change in the economy where we're starting to tax something we don't want, which is waste. And we will find ways to offset that by stopping the tax things that we do want, like companies hiring workers and innovation. Right now, we have many taxes on things that are supposed to be social goods, and we're not taxing these bads. And so I actually think that we're in a very optimistic situation in terms of finally getting on with the job. But what's unclear is how much of the warming, not that we're already committed to, because we're committed to quite a bit, but how much of the environmental change that we could avoid by accelerating this transition when we actually get on. Because no one likes to retire things early, let alone myself. Um, but we need to find ways to rapidly ramp out dirtier technologies and ramp in clean. And so the gas example I highlighted for the US is really interesting. Because this is the single largest change, I have no idea where it is anymore in that craft, um, but the change in, in coal is the single largest change we've seen in this industry in a long time. And the real challenge is, do we swap out coal for gas, but use that gas to enable clean energy, 
Or does that gas itself block that energy? And we suddenly say, well, we did this wonderful thing, but we did it in a way that that low price gas it now has a stranglehold, as opposed to being used as a way to fill in intermittencies from renewables. That's a story we're only beginning on. So it's a real challenge, but I think we're in the right spot to do something. I just don't know if it's too late. I'm told that uh, we have a reception outside, and we've already overworked our speaker for 40 minutes. So I'm going to give one more question to a person I promised it to. And then, uh, why don't you come up and bring your questions at the reception to our speaker? And for those of you who can go, thank you so much. This is a really interesting conversation. Uh, I'm, I'm Bob Gamble. My question is, you mentioned flow batteries, and I've seen this type of battery around for years. Is there anything in the future that will actually make these things affordable on anywhere from a, a house to the county scale? So, real simple answer. Right now, flow batteries are built by a few hardware enthusiasts with and, and then they're operated by people in white lab coats. They are a technology where the number of units deployed is incredibly small. And one of the really important lessons, not just from the massive scale up of wind and solar made in China, is that technologies that you can mass produce typically follow this learning curve where the price falls roughly by 20% every time you double the number of units, of, of number of units built. Flow batteries are a wonderful example. They can work in that way. And the more we get them deployed, the systems I described here, communities right now, uh, Honolulu is now considering a bank of flow batteries, uh, partially because there's a flow battery company they want to support in Hawaii. But these are batteries that don't degrade. They have millions of cycles as opposed to hundreds or thousands of cycles for, for current batteries. And when you want a larger bat flow battery, you enlarge the amount of fluid and the, and the building that you store it in. So to my mind, flow batteries are perfectly positioned, but you're right, they're expensive now. They tend to be for celebrity or for, uh, for exotic locations. Banff, kind of this island I showed you here, tend to have them. But it's a technology that I think wonderfully fits in, and we've got to scale up production. Okay, thank you. Uh